like a, a genre. So, so we have like uh, questions about Homer from Porphyry. And so where you say, okay, I have questions about this author. And then you list out the questions and you give them answers. And mm -hmm. so he's doing that here for Plato. And so he says, I have 10 questions about Plato's um, um, about Plato's position on poetry and on musique, on the muses, on the arts of the muses. And and then I'm going to answer them. There seems to be some order, but it's it's not entirely clear to me still, and also not to the, the translator, what is like, if, what, what exactly governs this order. But let's read this and then um, uh, I'll talk. Okay. Yeah, okay. So should I just read? Okay, it's necessary. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, first, to state and resolve the puzzles about the reason why Plato does not receive the art of poetry, rather expels it from the correct political order. Right. Even as if he does pour myrrh over it, as is fitting for statues in the most holy of rites, and crown it as holy, just as was customary to crown these statues. That's the Republic. I don't remember that part. Yeah, here, let me... There's some, isn't that, that like part. cynical, like where he says, let's... So, so yeah, I mean, that's the usual... Uh... Like one of the things where Socrates goes, well, you're so holy, let me give you a... We're going to crown... Oh, here he says, we're going to crown the poets and send them away. Yeah, exactly, yeah. here. Uh, there, can you see it? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. And that, that yeah, uh, so if, if, if like you should ever arrive, you... send them to another city. It's like the yeah. keep the czar holy and away from us. That's how I thought about you know. That. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so there's this uh, thing, and yeah, of course, um, um, uh, maybe like a more natural reading would be to say, oh, the, he's just you know making fun of him, or he's not really being serious. There's another passage about the poetry that's like this. Um, which is when uh, he says, well, if, if these myths do have a, a hidden meaning, well, then they should only be allowed to initiates that sacrifice something at least as, you know, as like a large pig or something like that, of the greatest mysteries. And it's uh, often that when we think that Plato is being ironic or being funny the neoplatonists think that he is saying something very deep hmm. and so this is uh this is just a case um also he i mean in the in this i mean this also in the sixth essay we'll see he quotes a bunch of passages where plato does seem to quote um homer as an authority or other uh, poets. And so there is also that that issue, right? So why uh, you might want to take this more seriously. Okay, I see. Yeah. I mean, there's also the thing, okay, I guess we'll get to all these things. Yeah, but it's funny. There's also the thing where he thinks that, that poets might be divinely inspired, but they don't know what they're talking about or something like that. Uh, yeah, yeah, in the eye, yeah. yeah. Okay. This itself, okay, so we have to investigate this. If there's, if according to him, there's something divine about poetry, how is it to be thrown out of what is a divine political order? So meaning the, the state the, the republic is creating. And if there is not something divine about it, then how is it to be honored with the honors that belong to the gods? Okay, so that's right. one question. Interesting question. Yeah, and just something to have in the background, we'll come back to this. So for Proclus, the... the ideal city is the world right this world is the city described in the republic the republic is actually about physics also the sophists and the statesmen are about physics Shocking. i mean you wouldn't think think of it but yes okay um, okay so let's yeah okay so okay second Okay, we'll see if this is a good question. Second, why in the world does he not admit tragedy and comedy in particular when these things contribute to the expiation of Phocius? Um, Phocius is passion. the passion. 
Right. So here he has in mind Aristotle's theory, right? That by seeing the passions, by seeing um, uh, uh, things that evoke strong passions, we are somehow purified of it, right? This cathartic function of art, which is a, a view that Iamblichus took on. And Iamblichus uses this in the De Mysteries to explain some rites. I think especially he uses it to talk about um, why it's okay to have phallic rites. And he says, well, it's an expiation of our sensual desires. And um, Proclus is now going to uh, right. discuss okay. why is this rejected by Plato. Okay, people often say that Aristotle is like answering Plato there and... Exactly, and, and and this is now uh, Brockles. And now what is stuff. why doesn't Plato agree to that? Okay, yeah. these passions are impossible to shut out entirely or to indulge in safely, and which doubtless demands some exercise at an opportune moment. Um, an exercise which, when it's fulfilled, when it's been fulfilled, and the hearing of these mm -hmm. renders us undisturbed by these passions the rest of the time. Because that's like the theory that we're like putting it into like some safe. It's like um, containment of the passions to the tragedy. Exactly, exactly. It's uh, it's better for men to just watch war movies than to go out and fight. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's question two. Third question. How can it be that in the symposium, he has forced both Agathon and Aristophanes to agree that comedy and tragedy are products of the same knowledge? Of the Republic, he does not want the same person to be the creator of both, even though these things are closely related. related. Okay, I'm not going to remember this. Nor for the matter, is willing for the same person to be an actor in both, not even allowing for the fact that the actor is an imitator. This has to do with the Republic's whole thing with the like separation of that everyone is only allowed to do one thing. Exactly. Everyone's only allowed to do one thing, so you're not even allowed to be an actor that does both. Um, um, comedy and tragedy. If each person does one thing better than doing two things, then each person, then even if you're an imitator, you should only imitate one thing, not two. And what is the the I don't what's the symposium thing that is? The symposium, if I remember correctly, it's just a throwaway com uh, comment at the end, um, where he it's. Yeah, it, it's at the very end, and and then uh, it, it says that Socrates was driving them to the admission that the same man could have the knowledge required for writing comedy and tragedy, um, right? Because you know Agathon has just won the um, the prize for his tragedy, and Aristophanes is known for his comedies, right? And and then Socrates is then presented as being like the in the middle of the two. That the fully skilled tragedian could be a comedian as well, and uh, yeah, and it's uh, it's the very end of the text. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. Is this also? Uh, don't. Is this the like the Republic saying that therefore you can't have actors at all because actors are imitators and then they're by definition doing more than one thing or something like that? Well, but the next I step mean, of what happens when you do that. I don't remember. Yeah, I, I, would, I mean, that's that's part of it. I mean, that's certainly one ultimate conclusion, although I don't recall if he actually admits, well, you can enact certain plays or something like that. But in general, yeah, the, it seems the opportunities for imitation are very restricted. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, now fourth. Why on earth does Socrates say that he does not know the musical modes which are fitting for a symposium or for lamentation? Nor for those which is interlocutor offers us better than the others and more useful for the for education. And he also says that he knows something about rhythms, laying claim to this on the basis of Daemon's teaching, and refers to those Russians to those rhythms which Damon taught him. Mm. Yeah, so why does Socrates, there seems to be some 
inconsistency in how Plato characterizes Socrates, saying that he's, he's ignorant about some things of music, but he also had this great music teacher. What's going on here? Hmm. Okay, I never understood that. There's like this whole thing where like there's different kinds of uh, harmonies that are for each thing, and yeah, and then there's some kind of music that incurred some kinds of passions, and others, others. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Part that Alan Bloom loves discusses it at length in in, oh, in yeah. closing. About which, about having like rapping bad and things like that. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, and but Socrates is like, you should, you should tell me, and I don't know, or I do know, and there's the, yeah. there's some middle that we don't have the mo music for, something like I don't remember, something like that. Exactly. Yeah. He says, look, I don't know, Glaucon. Why don't you tell me? Things like that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Fifth, what is the real art of the muses? according to Plato. And what is the second and third order art of music? Musique. Um, um, yeah. So, 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 so this is a problem. It's just um, a problem that we have translating musique that is like really, I mean, it's much broader than just the music and like arts or culture. And of course, Plato sometimes wants to say that the true musique is philosophy. And and so this is like he's trying to and Plato has different things to say in different places, so he's trying to figure out what what exactly musica is in Plato. So is there is there like what's the second and third? That's what I'm like. There's a real so, level sense of of that, and then the yeah. So this is going to be his like Platonic view that the, you know the true musica is. Um, is philosophy, and then the second order is going to be some like uh, didactic poetry accompanied by music and things like that. Okay, so he seems to say, in any event, say different things about these in different places. He doubtless sets up poetry as a kind of music. Eh? At another point, he separates it from music. It doesn't have uh, locations where that is, but okay. He'll give locations when he comes. So poetry me as in uh like what Homer does, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Six is which kinds of musical modes does he accept as useful for education? Which is the one that the poet must attempt in his view. And which of the leaders must picked out which which one? It's the same question, right? These, after all, seem to have been left undefined, though they're particularly in need of definition for those who are to discuss education. So this is about where they, where he like gives like we should have only good stories about the gods and so on, and he doesn't give a right. He doesn't tell, yeah give you, tell you the rhythm that the the poem should be in, right, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Seventh, what does he say are the errors of the poets he could have known in his time? Mm, who could have known? Uh, Plato. Plato could have known. Because Plato only discusses really old people. He only discusses Homer and Hesiod, Simonides. He doesn't discuss the poets of his time. And so, um, directly. Um, so, that's what Proclus is asking. Well... What should we say, you know? Okay, and what are the reasons he says the muses could never be in error again? I'm not sure. So he's just asking a question. What are the errors that Plato's poets are having? Yeah. As opposed to the ones that we should ask also about. Right. Yeah. And what are the reasons it's he says the muses could never be in error? Yeah, that's just the contradiction. Just, if the muses can't be an error, then they can't have mistakes. Yeah, that's, true. that's probably the explanation. Because otherwise, otherwise, I don't see how these two connect, um, questions are correct are connected. Yeah, through the understanding of these things, we should discover how it was that he was the best critic of poetry, not as some thought among the worst due to his praise for the poetry of Solon and the Timaeus. 
Yeah. Obviously, so, there were people who thought Solo was a really bad poet. Okay, and if Plato holds of him, that means that he didn't understand poetry, and yeah. therefore... Okay. Eight is who is the best poet according to Plato, and what are the qualities of both content of style and style that he excels at so as to be characterized as the best? Okay. And after all, we need we think there needs there needs to be someone who has been entirely successful to whom one looks, right? So this is like his idea of a model, like we need to have a perfect poet by whose Yeah, yeah. The the, the question isn't specifically who like who of the extant poets is the best, but rather um what would the model be? Okay. Nine. Is what is the objective or telos of the correct poetry according to it? So we need to have both of these things. We need to have a a best poet and like a goal, a correct goal or objective of poetry. After all, it's necessary in every case for correctness to have reference to some objective or goal. And it's through this that there is either correct or bad practices that make for the success or failure of each endeavor. Okay. And tenth, who is the poet in the universe? The one to the poet here below looks so the poet like the form of poet, um, like the, the form of poet, or rather, in some sense, what in the cosmos plays the role of poet? Okay. So not necessarily the um, the form, but it, you know, it could be like a planet or something. It could be like something like the demiurge. If the demiurge is the is the one that organizes the whole world, is the king of the world. Who's the poet? After all, among the things that are truly good, there is not one that fails to exist much. No, it's hard. The one to whom that, and can be, the one to whom the poet here below looks when the latter realizes his proper end. After all, among the things that are truly good, there is not one that fails to exist much prior among universal things than among particular. So assuming that there is a good poetry, it needs to exist in a universal way. Right. Universal here, the word can also mean total, just like particular here can mean partial. And Prokos uses this distinction to distinguish between the the um, well, the structure of the cosmos, the perpetual structure of the cosmos, that's universal, and then the particular partial things, which are the things that keep changing. And and so, and like he thinks that, for instance, where every animal species exists prior in the universal things, the total things, not just since the species exists independent of the um, individual animals, but there's even like one specific heavenly body that's, um, um, that governs its cycles and that's the um, mm -hmm. its thing. So, um, and so he's saying, you know, also if, uh, if poetry is one of those things that belongs to goodness, then it, it has to also be manifested in this world. Yeah. Um, okay. So um, about the order, so you said the, the last two are connect are definitely connected because I mean, or the last three, they start they have a more universal quality, right? They're about who is the best poet, what's the object of poetry, who is the poet in the universe, right? And so he goes on to talk about directly about what uh, poetry is. The beginning is about, in some sense, what is negative about poetry, right? Why? So why is it banned? And then he talks about tragedy and comedy, which are the worst kinds, um, as we'll see, because they encourage awful passion, excessive passions. So um, one, two, three is all about that. Um, and then... For, um, yeah, the middle ones, I don't quite see what unifies them. Um, I mean, the four, five, six, we could say that four, five, six, seven are all connected by the concept of the muses um, in different ways. But um, that, uh, and that seems to be the, connection, but I don't see him developing 
like I saw in the in the elements that he's like developing one single uh, argument throughout the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, in their introduction, the translators they discuss um, they discuss some views, right? According to which there's a contradiction between this um, this essay and the following one, because like this essay hardly mentions allegory, and allegory is central to the thought to, um, to essay six. And but I but they the translators of this thing and uh, argue and I agree with them that there isn't really a contradiction when they appear to contradict. They're talking about different things, and, and as we read, I'll show that there's actually many parts of this that are really vital to understanding the six. And in general, the I think part of the um, impression that they contradict each other is like the six seems to be trying to save the poets by using allegory, amongst other uh, things. And um, here, however, I think that uh, um, we see more of the negative side of poetry is criticizing it more. That's actually compatible with the six, something good from the poets through allegory, but for most people, it is bad for their souls. Mm -hmm. And so that um, that, agree that establishes some agreement between the two. Okay. Um, there's... Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's it for introduction. Okay. Right. Yeah, there's also like... We can some... uh, jump um, into the first... There's some questions that are like textual questions, or is like really just trying to like figure out what's going on? Like... Uh, so the, there are the textual uh, questions, but we'll some see that signs sometimes. That does. Yeah, there are textual questions. Well, in order to solve the textual questions, uh, Frockel sometimes appeals to metaphysics, right? Saying, oh, there's not a contradiction here because Plato had this metaphysical theory. So, um, and, but yeah, for. Proclus, you know, solving the details of the text of Plato's text and figuring out what reality is like are one and the same activity, really. Mm -hmm. so. Um, okay. So he's gonna begin at the top and tell yeah. us why when he was giving the outlines of educational theory, he did not accept poetry. Even though these things were well regarded as educate educative in those times. Meaning something like if you go to school, they would teach you Homer's poems. Right. Education involved learning. Right. Homer, the teacher of the Greeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's like the textbook, right? Or something like Yeah. He seems to want to change the the like books that are read in school. Yeah. As as education. Okay. It seems that. Since all poetic activity is mimetic, you recognize that there are two ways for them to go wrong in their mimetic activities. One is that sometimes they represent the things about which they produce their narratives in a way that lacks similitude. So the, that's like the first, uh, hmm, that they represent the gods in ways that don't that are not like the gods. So they're bad imitation. You're not similar, right? Right, or the yeah. So the the gods fight, or heroes cry too much, things like that. Okay. Other times, there is sim similitude, similitude, but since they are imitators of various things, they produce correspondingly various imitations, as one would expect. And the problem with that is. Hmm, He'll, he'll he'll get to that, but the problem with that is that it it generates divert it, it generates lack of unity in people's characters. You see all these different lives on stage or in poetry, and then you your and then so the young person sees all these different characters they could be, and they end up as it were wanting to be many different things or 
having a diverse life instead of just focusing on one thing. Mm. Okay. So going back to the republics, like one, like sort of definition of justice is everyone doing one thing. Yeah. The right thing for them. Okay. When they imitate things that is interesting. Okay. So when they imitate things that concern gods or heroes, they're thus unaware of the fact that they imitate in a way that lacks similitude because they seem to think that gods can do all these things. Yeah. They attempt to say something about them through impassioned language and even contrary to nature or contrary to divine law, whether within the fictions of myth or outside of the myths. Right. The, yeah, the translators think that this refers to um, when uh, a poets uh, take um, poetic license and like develop a myth in a certain oh, Outside the myth, meaning like the, the fan fiction parts of the myth. Like, uh... The fan fiction parts, exactly. Yes. <laughs> so... Yeah. So, I think that there's a problem that they, they don't even know that they're doing it wrong. Okay. Right. On the one hand, they assimilate heroic things to human traits and verbally drag them down into the same passions like greed, illiberal, illiberality, pretentiousness, and licentiousness. Those things are entirely unworthy of heroes whom we take to be the children of the gods. Okay. On the other hand, in the case of the gods, they use indecent language as a screen for the truth about them. Hmm. But these being these beings, these being matters about which it's not easy for the audience in general and for young people in particular to become competent readers. Right here, it's a uh, you see he, he draws a distinction between dealing with the gods and with the heroes that he will deal also he'll do the same distinction in the in this in the sixth essay so when you get to the gods you use allegory to explain what's going on and then when but you don't use that for heroes it's specifically um, because the gods are you know, beyond the world that you can use this um um, this kind of uh, allegory, but that doesn't work with heroes because heroes are supposed to be people, right? Mm -hmm. And then there in the sixth essay, he appeals to things like, oh, this was the custom back then, or um, or so there's another way to interpret these words, but um, not an allegorical way, just this is just a different uh, oh, so, so 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 the heroes are when he says, um. We have poets bringing down, making heroes have bad traits. And that is bad because the heroes never had bad traits or they shouldn't have had. Yeah. Like, they were they actually people that. or were they actually children of the gods? Or is that? So typically they're children of gods and people. Um, the, um, they, but they shouldn't have bad traits in in the, in the Republic because, uh, you know, these stories are told to children and children have to be raised in virtue and you can't say, oh, the people who are the children of the best, right, because they're always, are, are always good and always the best, um, are act in, in these uh, un, unbecoming ways. Um, and uh, so the, the, you know, and have them be immoral. That's the idea. Um, in the Republic, that's what... Uh, and so, yeah. As I said, prophets will then always argue and say, well, it's not that immoral or something like that. You have to that is, that is a kind of... This kind of thing. That's a kind of like uh, educational argument, right? It's like, even if they would have done bad things, we should have yeah. got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, it's an educational argument. Also, it should be said that, you know, for for Proclus, so Proclus also uses hero as the name for a kind of daimon, right? And I mean, he, uses, he does this because, you know, there were, there were hero cults, right? And so, you know, uh, at, at tombs of heroes, there were, um, there were sacrifices made and so on, religious rituals. And um, Proclus... Um, so there are these divine beings that are heroes, but importantly for Proclus, these aren't actually children of um, of the gods or 
with human beings. If they're daimonists in Proclus's um, in Proclus's metaphysics, then they can never have been a human being. Remember, the daimonists always attend the gods, right? They're the the, the mediate, uh, the intermediate kind of soul. And so he has explanations like saying that the the people who are in who are the human beings that are called heroes um, have some kind of special relationship with the daimon, which is a hero of a, of the hero kind, but they're not actually heroes. Okay? So mm. um, this is um, just something to have in mind. Um, okay, so. So yeah, so it, it's all it's 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 an educational thing. Um, it's an education. Okay. Thing. So. Okay. Yes, yeah, so though it's weird to say that it's a not similar. Not you're not accurately representing the heroes. It's more than like well, if maybe like in the sense of like the idea of a hero or the idea. Right. Right. And I think, but I think the idea from Plato is that they they wouldn't. Like that, right? So, like, would do they real like um just maybe like would he really say that the uh like would you say something like although the he cries in Homer they actually never cried or would he say uh so or when, the, the well, truth, is it like a historical kind of truth question or is it like yeah, so like, um, well, uh, so I don't remember the crying instance, but there are moments where Proclus will say, oh, he gives into the passions here, I forget which, because he's a man of action, he's not a man of theory, and so it's appropriate for him to do this here. Or there's one where about Plato criticizes the funeral practice, and then he says, well, this this is actually has to do with the custom of uh, um, of this place. And so he gives these kinds of explanations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so, but we'll have to figure out if the children that we teach them to understand those explanations, because then. Exactly. Exactly. Also, because the so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because the. The prophet writes his text for other philosophers, and he's and and in his text he's clear that even with all these explanations, it's still better for very few people to 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 read Homer. So so he like agrees with Plato in the practical sense that we should take this out of the curriculum. He does, he does. Although you know he says also that you know Plato Plato has all these strictures for the best kind of city, but we don't live in the best kind of city. Mm -hmm. um, we'll see him talk about this soon also in 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 this uh, in this question okay so but so both these things manifest imitation that lack semblance so it's like a fake imitation or one of them obviously yeah. does not conform to that which it imitates meaning the hero one while the other mm -hmm. does not obviously conform due to the appearance of absurdity corresponding to the screen of myth making hmm Right. Okay. It is necessary for the one who imitates to choose concept to add appropriate to their things, given that they are intended as icons of those things. And you must select language that is fitting for these conceptions. And it's for this reason that he was long in the habit of saying about the poetry of divine myths that it lies beautifully. Right, that's the um, that's how he introduces myths when he's discussing um, them uh, when he starts discussing them in Book Two of the Republic. Right? He says that they should lie beautifully. This confuses Agathon. Uh, I mean, this confuses Glaucon, and then he explains, well, you know, they should tell the myth, but it should be similar to the uh, to, mm -hmm. to the object. And that's because he wanted there to be uh, imitations, uh, and at least at this stage of the story. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it's like, 
but the imitation has to be in the correct way, right? Yeah, um, exactly. Because because it's for children, and children can't distinguish between a true sense and a surface sense. Children will just get the surface sense, and so the surface has to be okay. Okay, calling that lie beautiful, which hides the truth through beautiful language. So that's about about the gods. You should lie beautifully about the gods. Um, however, on the subject of imitation of things to do with the heroes, it did not say that it fails to lie beautifully, but rather that it simply lies whenever it portrays these heroes to be like human beings. Thus, in the case where it should speak the truth, poetry lies to the inappropriateness of the passage which the poet rejects upon the heroes. But in the case where it ought to lie, it does not manage to do that beautifully due to the inappropriateness of the language it employs and the divine image that refer to the gods. Okay. So for the gods, you should lie, but you should make sure that they're beautiful lies. And beautiful meaning uh, he has this thing of an icon going on here. It's right, like something like a beautiful statue. Yeah, I mean, like the, I mean, the examples of beautiful myths are, you know, Plato's own myths. In Plato's own myths, you never see the gods behaving badly; they're always all good. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and regarding the heroes, you should not lie at all. Yeah. The sense of well, it's still gonna be an imitation, but in the sense of the the something. The sense of the something? What what is what is the what is the correct um hero story? One that doesn't lie. Right. So he heroes are human beings. So I mean they are more mortals like us. And so you should just portray them with, yeah, um, as without exaggerated passions and so on, as, as you know, excellent human beings. The gods, you have to, in some sense, end up lying because, like, they're not in place and we can't really imagine them. And so, all these things about them wandering the cosmos and talking as if they were human beings, these are all clearly lies. Right, this is inevitable allegory that you're going to have to use, but um, but there's no inevitability about allegory in the case of heroes. You know, oh, okay, okay. There. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I see. So, so you shouldn't say bad things about the gods, but you should say like human things about the gods, right. uh, some or some level of human things, which would be a lie, but at least that's a beautiful lie. And yeah. the heroes, which are human, so we don't have the problem of like. Uh, Giving them being human descriptions different. and things like that, but we should just not lie. So it's the same thing, right? In both cases, it's just saying don't say, don't have your people, right? The characters of your story do bad things. It's just that in the case of the gods, it's like don't pretend they do bad things. In the case of the heroes, don't say they do bad things. Because right. whenever we talk about gods, we're pretending right. or lying. Yeah. Okay. And, and and this thing about myths being lies is like in Hesiod, right? In the beginning of the Theogony, the, he tells about how the muses gave him song, taught him to sing, and they start talking, you know, that we can we can reveal the truth and also tell many lies. So, mm -hmm. okay. As he clearly says in the Timaeus, the explanation for these things is that the race of imitators is particularly capable of imitating those things that they were raised with. That which lies outside each person's upbringing is something that becomes hard for him to imitate in action and harder still in words. Thus, the poets are not able to give their heroes deeds that are fitting to them, and through these deeds imitate the things that belong to the way of life, doing some things bravely and others with self-control nor are they able to give them speech that they might actually utter, whether it be for someone engaged in war or peace or addressed to gods or to humans. Rather, they give them such language as the many use when they blaspheme the gods and speak boldly or when they flatter and insult other people. Right. 
So this is why poets do imitate the way they do, um, why they write the way they write, because they just project their own environment onto what they're imitating. But well, they can't, like in order to, is this like a necessity or is it like... Well, it says a, it's a difficult. He it says it's difficult, not impossible, right? So, but yeah, because it's likely that they can't. Okay. And this is like, like Homer. Like Homer was saying yeah. these things about the heroes because he was a bad person. Well, yeah. Well, bad the way that most people are bad. Yeah. Okay. It they go wrong for the same reason when it comes to the gods. On the basis of understanding the language that they are accustomed to and the things to which they were raised, they suppose such things to contribute towards concealing the gods. This is so funny that he like puts in this concealing already. Thefts, rapes, mistakes, adulteries, <laughs> wars, and plots that involve the gods. It's like, I know that you're lying, but why are you giving us this these lies? Like, yeah. While they entirely neglect to apply I mean, yeah, it makes sense if someone like criticizes fiction and says, like, yeah, we all agree that we're writing fiction, but that you still might be talking about yourself. Yeah. While the entire neglect to apply to the things about which they speak those very words that belong to people who are brought up properly and which are repeated constantly, high and low, and well-functioning polities. So he says, if you would have been brought up in the correct republic, you would not even be used to talking about all these things. You would have been talking about right, justice, law, simplicity, respect, and all such things. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. These are part of the shared upbringings of people who have been properly turned into citizens. In any event, so it's sort of backwards. Like it started off by saying that the that the uh like Plato starts off by saying that if you tell kids these stories, they will turn out to be similar to the heroes of these stories, therefore you shouldn't say it. And now he's saying, well, the reason why they say these stories is because they were brought up uh, by these stories <laughs> or in the society with, in which these stories sort of make sense or come out. Right, right. It, it, it's a cycle. You know, education just reproduces the, the environment. And so if you want the new, a new city, which is the best city, you're going to have to have different stories. Mm-hmm. That's why you know Plato has this thing about oh if you're, we're actually going to found the republic we're going to have to take we're going to have to expel all the adults and just keep the children because yeah, it's very hard to stop this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, at any event, it is unbearable for them to have things that are shameful and illicit uttered, so they do not hold it fitting to defile the tongue by saying these words, since wait this is another thing. Since the tongue is an instrument for celebrating the gods and for conversing with good people. Yes, it's a, it's a, a neat definition of what the tongue is. Hmm. So, so this is like another thing, like, uh, because I keep on. We keep on, I keep on bumping into this thing here where, like, are we talking about actions or about words? Like, uh, what if you have a bad city and you start giving them good myths? Will they actually turn and turn become good, or maybe they'll just become hypocritical? Right. Like, someone could say um, this is basically a story of you know what happens when you know you get uh, people doing this in different ways. Right. This is a. Uh, um... That's a question that Plato doesn't deal with in the um, in the Republic, and it's not the question that Proclus is dealing with here. I mean, I think for me, as far as I can understand, Proclus' considered position is, you know, most people have to be evil, so and the myths are one way of doing this. So, um, and. Um, he doesn't think that, you know, there isn't this, like the, the plan of the perfect city down here just isn't part of the, it isn't feasible and it's not part of uh, part of what Plato wants. 
right? Okay, but like what he, what he's doing, he is doing the other side of the same thing, which is like something like, okay, so assuming that you are a good person, so okay, maybe you wouldn't invent bad myths because of people tending to do what they're used to or imitating based on what they know. Um, but this thing with the tongue seems to be giving a reason why, like, imagine I'm a good person. I don't think I will be corrupted by telling a bad story. But maybe it's just like a bad use for my tongue. Exactly. So the the use of a thing, the end of a thing is the best thing that you can do for it, what you can do with it. That's a criterion in the Republic. And so the best thing you can do with your tongue, uh, with language is to celebrate the gods and talk with good people. And so you, you wouldn't use it for um, for something else. Right. Okay. Thus, since the imitation that lacks semblance is double, so about the gods and the heroes, his rebuke against the poets is offered in these terms. What they do is similar either to the case where someone intends to represent Achilles in a picture, but mistakenly depicts Theristes or S, right? Like that. Or else, right. it is similar to the case where he presents Achilles, but does not preserve his courageous way of life. The opposite of what he called in the laws, well and with correctness. So that would be the correct picture of Achilles. Yeah. Um, and now there's the, the second point um, about um, variety. Okay, he approached the, so this is like the, the. so again, the first reason why we we can't have poetry is because of two problems, because of bad imitations, we call it. Bad imitations, both bad in the sense of wrong, like you think you're depicting a god, but you're depicting something that can't be a god. Although any depiction is fake, it's still bad. And the other one is wrong because... Uh, it's just wrong. Okay. Okay, then, then there's a second thing. Okay, that's what he said. There's these things that are not similar and the things that are similar, but are too many of them or something like that. Yeah, so we're going to go into that one now. Okay. He approached the poetic imitation that involved likeness in another manner, to the lifelike similitude of various kinds of moral characters. Since we find imitations of cowards, those lacking in self-control or intellect, that are as lively as those of the brave, the self-controlled and wise. So you can have just as good a representation of both of these contrary uh, things. This variety is unsuited in every way to education. Since education strives to imprint the characters of those who are educated solely with good in both word and deed. The human soul naturally delights in imitations. This is why we're all fond of stories. And why, if when we are young, we should we become habit habituated to living with a great diversity in our imitations? We then become assimilated to them due to our devotion. Devotion, meaning being devoted to imitation. Right, to uh, our love of the stories. Right, so if... Yeah. We become people such as them. So people love stories because they like imitation and be, like something like we're imitative beings and we imitate things and we tell mm -hmm. stories and then we become those stories and so on. Exactly. Right. Part of the, um, yeah. So part of what we enjoy is our ability to identify with characters. And so we're seeing uh, courageous people and cowardly people, people who work hard, people who are lazy. We identify with all these different um, different ways of life. Okay, and then we become people such as them. And diverse character develops from enjoyment of variety since we're molded by diverse imitations. Okay, and why is that? Okay, so we're going to get, okay, so the problem is that you we should like have only one story or one hero. That would be good. Right which is the good yeah. one. Since there's too many yeah. of them always. And it'd be very hard to have a good story with only like one character, which is the good one. Like that would be very boring. 
Um, I'm not sure. Right, or we should have, have, you know, not just one character, but everyone you know, should be somehow seen to be virtuous or something like that. Yeah. And what uh, all those characters go around doing? Like they're never going to fight <laughs> the evil guys. Okay. Well, I guess uh, I guess they'll make things. Right. Okay. Okay, once again, the explanations, and the reason is the same reason as before. Why poetry tends, why does it produce various kinds of character rather than simplicity is the same which we earlier said has been written in Temes, that the race of imitators finds it easier to imitate the things in which they were brought up. Since the poets were brought up with all manners of people with varied characters, they dislike imitation of those who are simple and straightforward in their character. They produce poems that are right. like those varied characters, yeah. and which are capable of making other people who take them seriously like them too. So something like right. So, uh, so there's a, a a slight shift here, right? Here it's not just that they produce varied characters, um, but she said they dislike the imitation of those who are simple and straightforward in their character. So it's not only that the the there are all kinds of people um, portrayed in, in poetry. But that they don't portray anyone who's simple-minded. Everyone's complicated, right? They have opposing desires and things, but they never portray the simple guy, the, uh, the person who, you know, just wants to be a sage, just wants to do the right thing. So there is not any such person yeah. because because of learning about too many people. Exactly. It's like we. As we grow up, and as people grow up, they're exposed to all kinds of people in, in art that they then identify with. And then they become, you know, diverse, complicated people without a unity in their soul. And um, and then later, when they, when they write, uh, when they become poets, they both, A, fill their stories with many different kinds of people, and B, each of those people is not a simple person. Uh, each of those people has many things in them. And it would be good to be simple. It's good to be simple. Um, so this is, you know, this basic, uh, like, this ethical commitment that comes out of the, of the elements, Proposition 13, right? Unity is identical with goodness. So um, when we want something we want ultimately to be also you know ourselves and the you know everything when it loses its own unity it's destroyed and 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 it continues in being as long as it manages to hold all its parts together so the search um yeah the good what really gives things value is um unity and so for Proclus, and that's also like the um, the Platonic education, you know, why do you abandon your desires, right? It's because they distract you. They make you identify with many things. You want many different things. And then you get split and you have conflicts within yourself. So you want always to be more and more simple, more and more one. That's the um, ideal here. You can, I mean, you can ask, but well, why can't, what's the problem with then just being a simple-minded killer? Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you, you know, this guy has really organized his whole life. Everything is for one goal, and that goal happens to be killing other people. Um, and, well, I mean, there's one answer, which is simply, well, Killing people is an action of division, of producing multiplicity. You're kill, you're taking life away from them. Um, uh, dead things are more multiple than living things. So this is obviously not what you're. Um, so this is not obviously seeking unity. Um, it, unity is not what you want. So that's that's one answer. Um, but I mean, on another answer, you might say, well, there is a place for such a person, you know, there, we need, 
uh, executioners. Um, and um, yeah, so and so there's that one function that needs to be realized. And then that's the that would be more of the other point of view, which is to say, you know, and ultimately for Proclus, we have all these many different values. Each one of them is a unity, each one of them is a god, and they all need to be realized. Of course, down here, they're realized with opposition and not through harmony. Okay. Um, yeah, where I mean. Okay, so that's why we have everyone being complicated. Okay. They produce poems uh, that are like those varied characters, which are capable of making other people take them seriously. Okay, so take them seriously. Like that too. Hmm. Therefore, we shall find yeah. too that those among our contemporaries are particularly keen on those matters, possess characters that are particularly varied. So they're like people that are into uh, the myths and they become weird people. Yeah. So I mean, later he'll 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 talk about the people who aren't into, and then he says, "Well, but if other the the alternative is that people don't take these things seriously, and then they don't take myths seriously at all." And then this leads them to not believing the gods. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Okay. Like he would really like like Medrash that hates complicated characters. And like either you're a really bad guy or a really good guy. And there's like nobody in between. Yeah. Yeah. Medrash is like that. Yeah. At least. Well, at least there's like a, yeah, they have like this rule where like, uh, mm. we, sh we should, Try to make the good people better and the worst people worse. Mm -hmm. If they're always like that, I don't know. Yeah, there's such a there is such a thing, which leads to all kind of like uh, you know uh, weird uh, interpretations. Where like if there's like a whole story where you know David did something bad, we have to interpret that as nothing ever happened because he's a but good guy according to like basic rules. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Let me. Um. There's any invent the argument. What? Right. Continue. Sorry. Uh. Yeah. The argument in which. Uh. Where am I? It's okay. There's people that are right. There is an invent the argument that in all cases wonder assimilates one to the object of wonder. That's interesting. And every experience of pleasure unites one to the thing that pleases. Hmm. That's another thing besides for the thing of uh, people producing what they're like and becoming like what they stories and all kinds of wonder right. and pleasure connect you to that thing. Right. So, so this is something additional. So the first argument was based on the idea that we love imitating, we love imitation, right? And this is independent of our love of imitation or parallel to it. Anything that causes wonder draws us to it, and anything that causes pleasure also unites us, makes us want it. Hmm. So like, even if we see something awful on screen um, or on stage, but we take pleasure in that, um, in in watching that. Then we, you know, that unites us to that, right? So right, we but find ourselves that. thinking about that story afterwards. So there's the whole like like question about this because maybe like let's say someone really likes horror uh, movies, it doesn't usually they don't actually like horror. Mm. And yeah. there's like, like maybe there's the Aristotle answer where like, well, you like because you you're trying to confine the horror to like the theater or whatever. Yeah. But there's also the thing where like, yeah, that's good in the movie, but it's not good in real life. Right. There are some things that we want in our fantasy, but that we don't want in our in our day. Um. But, um, yeah, he is, 
I don't know what Buckles would would say about that, or well, I guess that's a clear case, maybe of like division of the soul, where part of you likes this, part of you doesn't. Your rational part doesn't, but your um, desiring part does. The adrenaline rush, and actually, this means that you're going to be in situations where you you know, you postpone, you know, you, you leave something to the last minute, but why did you do that? Well, you love the adrenaline and mm. of having to solve that at the last minute. Mm. People would like argue if, uh, you know, violent video games cause people to be violent. Um, and again, right. you could have the and confinement I mean... argument, but also people, you could say, you would say something like, maybe it Hmm. Maybe it leads people to want to pretend to be violent, which is a bad thing for their soul. Yeah, video games is interesting, right? Because video games is even more immersive than you know, uh, watching something or hear or reading or hearing something. And in some ways, I remember I, I saw a presentation on video games and attention in uh, in a workshop. Uh, um, when I was at the Hebrew University, and they, and it really struck me how, in some ways, we're all video game players for progress. Like, the the soul is playing, playing this life, right? Uh, right. Well, you got cut off. It's something I, I even got a book to. Uh, you got stuck. Sorry. I'm. Right here. Oh, can you hear me? Now I do. You've been freezing a little. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let's hope that doesn't keep happening. You said we're all playing video games in the soul, yeah. I mean, we're all playing video games in the soul, and I think there are many analogies to be drawn there, but I haven't sat down and worked through it. There is a thing of philosophy of video games nowadays. I hope to look into that someday. Okay. Yeah. but it seems like he because of the way like in which like everything is top down so it's probably would be very hard to believe that you could tell someone bad stories and it stay those stories like that would just that these are just stories they're not um right well well that's a point that he goes later which is then you know, but then if people start saying, oh, that's just a story, then the story loses educational value. Okay, so we won't, okay, I, I see. We don't really want, so So in other words, if someone could say like this, maybe playing violent video games leads you to take life not seriously. Be right. Like the action of there, there being this whole world that's just a game is in itself destructive. Right, right. Oh, like, that's, yeah. Because... Um, then, like I, I once had a friend who said that he couldn't read philosophy without um, just seeing all the rhetorical tricks that the philosopher was using to you, get you to convince his argument. And it meant that, you know, he, he read these texts very carefully, but he couldn't benefit from them because it was just all rhetoric for him and it all become a game. Mm-hmm. He couldn't read that, take it seriously. It's something I can learn from this. Right. That seems to be a real big, big girl problem. Okay. Or, yeah. But that's not what he's talking about here. Like, maybe later you said, okay. Not yet. He'll talk something more similar later. Like, you would say something like, if someone, I was, I don't know, at least sounds like something plausible. Like, someone says, yeah, well, I play all these crazy games or whatever. And it doesn't bother me. And I would say, I said, sure, it doesn't bother you. But why are you the kind of person who it doesn't bother? Because you should, right. be, you should be more impressionable. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. You, yeah, you, you should be more impressionable. That might be part of it. Yes. Um, okay. 
According to the, the, the law, there's an even, okay. According to the, okay, because of that, the laws and customs dealing with the education of young people must monitor such poetry, right? Like Plato's having these like police, culture police. Since because it is pleasant for youth, it is not at all conductive towards virtue. Indeed, the greater the pleasure, the more harmful it is because pleasure connects you to the... Mm -hmm. the one ought to select the muse that is on the one hand the most austere and on the other hand that leads directly to virtue. So he's like really not just being against pleasure. We do not regard as a wonder the medical art that pleasures but rather the one that heals. Well, what would be wrong if it would heal and give pleasure? The... Well, that, that would be ideal but um, as the myth of Prometheus teaches us the um, the life with the meat and the life um, dedicated to the gods are two separate things, right? The Prometheus put the meat on one on one side and the bones on the other, and the god and the gods chose the bones. Hmm. Um, so for for process, it's like part of the. Um, I mean, Proclus interprets that myth as saying that, you know, that's why the ascetic life is, is the one dedicated to the gods. But more seriously, if you have many pleasures, you're connected, you're, you're connected to many different things. You have to have few pleasures so that you're connected to few things in your symbol. Mm -hmm. Okay. We do not regard as wonder. Okay. And education of souls is a medical art, uh, which correct the irregularities and discord of passion and soul. Consequently, it is necessary for this form of medicine to be selected, as well as poems and activity gener activities generally, that contribute towards the elevation of the young. Not the things that delight but harm youth, but the things that produce order, even if they prove to be less pleasing. Okay. Right. So you're saying not things that do the opposite of pleasure, but the main purpose should be to produce order. Mm -hmm. And the education of souls is philosophy, right? That's the comparison from the Gorgias. Okay, let us say by way of summary that there are two explanations for why poetry may be an admissible and correct education. It may be an admissible in what, what it truthfully imitates. I have things to do with human beings on account of the variety involved in imitation. Alternatively, it may be an admissible in those things which it imitates falsely on account of the unbefitting nature of the imitation. The letter is twofold. It's either unbefitting the language alone, meaning the when we talk about gods, or it is unbefitting to the facts, as we have shown. Right. Okay. Now, okay, so we have still never talked about the sacredness thing. Yeah. Now, since we have generally assumed that poetry is sacred to the muses and that this origin for humans came about by virtue of their inspiration, it was truly entirely appropriate that he did not think it is necessary to send away this honor when he exiled from the city for the reason just mentioned. Rather, as sacred to the muses and afforded honors similar to those honors given to statues, so incense and a crown. But let us not think the following, that even if he should not turn out to be appropriate for the best city, it would not. It would reckon that this sort of poetry fails to harmonize with every way of life and is harmful for all. Rather, it will reckon that there are some people who would be benefited even from the words of this poetry. In any event, as he himself says, even the poetry that has represented divine beings falsely has a place in the intermediate mysteries. Hmm. Right. There's a note here that says that another... Um, um, so it's puzzling. What are these intermediate mysteries? It's not clear. There's another mention to intermediate mysteries in another place in Proclus, but it doesn't really. Uh, it's also he says a very puzzling passage. But he says you know there's a an emendation um, that the editor suggests, which is say instead of the intermediate mysteries, the greatest mysteries. And if the greatest mysteries, and this refers to the Republic passage, which says. Um, that the 
um, uh, the allegorical that myths which have an allegorical meaning should only be told to people after they've sacrificed made a large sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think that's yeah. uh, that the emendation by the uh, editor, although he doesn't like it, is uh, is a good explanation for this. So uh, the poetry that is represented by masters falsely has a place in the highest mystery. Mm -hmm. Whereas things that have been uttered in a symbolic manner appear to be fitting for the totality of the worship of the gods. So that's the mysteries things. Yeah, the recitation, recitation of these contributes towards the universal hieratic. Hieratic, I don't know how you say that word. Art, priestly art, right? Um, since the very life of the listeners has been established among the gods and can now safely hear such words, words to which the lowest class of pneumatic beings are invited in. Whatever this means, what are these things? Um, um, read uh, when these uh, things have the worked the their magic. And then I'll explain. Okay, when these have worked their magic by virtue of these symbols, they provide for the divine inspiration to proceed unhindered from these into us as if they had been satiated with the words and things which they delight. So just understand, he's saying that the, uh, Socrates sending the, sending off the poets with his like crown and things is serious because he's saying, well, for my city, it's not good, both because it's too bad and because it's too good. Like maybe there are some even worse people for who the poets are making slightly better. All right, I'd made that part up. Or maybe there is such great people who are somehow living in some world where these things are just sacred words that do things. Right. So he say, he he's saying, well, the you know the fact that he's sending them away from the best city doesn't mean that there's no context. Um, especially since he says that the poetry that represents the gods falsely has a place in the highest mystery. And then Proclus gives the explanation of that. Um, the idea is that um, the, so I understand the lowest class of pneumatic beings to be the, the lowest daimonists, right? So these daimonists, these spirits are those that are responsible for um, leading souls into irrational lives, right? They are the ones that make sure that, you know, some people become wolves, some people become uh, peacocks, and so on. And so, and Proclus talks about these evil diamonds sometimes, and he compares them to, for instance, a, um, a temple guard that keeps away the people that are, are impure from entering the temple. And so he says that when we try to approach the gods more impure, this kind of diamond shows up. And elsewhere, like in the Alcibiades commentary, at least, maybe also in the Timaeus commentary, he says that in every rite, these um, diamond is manifest. And in, in every um, initiation, these diamond is manifest. And they're like a, a test for the people there. So some people, that's why some people um get super frightened during the mysteries it's because they they're under the impact of these diamonds and um and so here he's talking about as if since they're um here he's talking about as if the listeners um can already safely hear the words so they so because of their state their their status they you know they're good enough people they've been purified so that these words won't affect them but elsewhere, he gives a different explanation, which is like, it's in order to, to test, to see who will be affected and who won't. Right? And he's saying that there's like, and what the, um, and what this stuff at the end is about is like, since these descriptions of the gods describe them as doing awful things, then they are like these daimonists, right, which lead people to do awful things, right? And so this is our way of connecting with this lowest level, and through this lowest level, we connect with the gods, hmm. right? Um, so, so as I said, uh, I describe them as like temple guards. So this would be, as it were, um, reciting these blasphemous things, reciting these false myths, 
um, uh, these false and ugly myths, not beautiful. They are, as it were, the um, the words of entry through which we get through the temple guard. Okay, so and in, get in, into the temple. So this is it, meaning. So this is means that these stories we stay bad. It's not like we have a they have a deeper meaning or something. Or I mean, they can also have a deeper meaning. But, but their that, surface meaning, at least, yeah. and the reason you say their surface the words, is because something like, um, yeah, in order to get into the temple, you need to bribe the guard, and the way to, I don't know, and we need to speak his language, which is like maybe he's a low class guy, so you're gonna speak in a low class way, and of course, don't get stuck there or something like that. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Or just, you know, very, very basic. Yeah. The, the person who guards the temple is not a very educated person. They take the myths really literally. And so you just have to say the stuff that's, you know, you think is awful and blasphemous, but you have to say that stuff to get, to get mm. yeah. Oh, we can also give us like the Tarasian kind of interpretation where like in order to be allowed into the church, you need to say whatever they have you say there. Because otherwise they throw you out, and that's not very good. Right, right. Although here there's, you know, there's, there's this context where Prophet thinks that it's, you know, it's necessary for, for mm -hmm. the world that there be this kind of blasphemy and vice. But yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, so that explains the faults. Right, it explains the false myths. It doesn't really right. tell the, us, however, exact uh, um, the, God the variety. It doesn't okay? Yeah, and it, it 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 doesn't explain the um the problem of how, how to justify the variety. Why would the variety be good in some places? It's going on those. We might fi also find that the imitation of a variety of kinds of moral character would be a beneficial thing to some people from the absence of variety is more harmful than variety. Okay. Oh, it's sorted for this reason that is useful for every tyrannical constitution. Since it does not allow for one person to take pleasure in the worst form of life alone, but rather introduces the elevation that results from the imitation of all kinds of ethical characters. Looking at the same time, both better and worse pursuits. It would seem that just as this variety is harmful for the form of constitution that is kingly and divine too, but the one that is lowest and tyrannical it is beneficial. Hmm. So this is what you right. said. So if you have, right, the tyrannical being the other constitution, which we don't want, but at least if you're like a really simply evil person, it might do you good to be at least a slightly more complicated person. Because there's sort of right. no way to and complicate it, yourself without becoming a little better. <laughs> yeah. Although, and maybe. It, yeah. And also, like, talking about, like, the tyrannical constitution, so a city, right, in a city that's um, where that's under the whims of a tyrant or where that just care a society that just cares about money or pleasure, it's good to have all these kinds of characters because then at least a few people will be able to, you know, uh, will be exposed to better ways of life, you know, better people. Mm -hmm. So for that city, you know, it makes sense to um, uh, explain everything. Now, this is really interesting because, as I said, the cosmos is the perfect city. And the uh, variety is a really big value in the cosmos. Um, that's the, you know, that's, you, know, you have to have all the different kinds of living being and so on. And so I, I understand this to be that um, why is variety good in the cosmos well because the cosmos is characterized by being bodily and having matter and so it's a it's a world characterized by separation so if there's going to be unity in the cosmos it's, it's because there's every kind of thing right and that's the way to you to assure that there's also unity because the tendency here is just for there to be multiplicity okay so and, and so that's why you know, why diversity is a value down. 
again because otherwise there would be too many things um right or the, um, there would just be um, extended things without any unity in them right Did, um, you mentioned Strauss so this is like the the Straussian argument that well you know we should defend a for instance a, a liberal society not because it is you know, oh, this is, you know, equality of rights for men and everyone's good for, and everyone's naturally good and they can be better people. So on. But rather because it's only in this freedom where everyone gets to do what they want that there will be at least some philosophers. People being what they are, if they try to institute some kind of theocracy or some kind of monarchy, it's just going to be all about money. Whereas if there's freedom and, you know, and if there's a variety and diversity, then at least there will be space for some people to be philosophers. Mm -hmm. Right. So something sort of like if there would be like this whole difference between tyranny and, and like the enlightened monarchy or whatever we call the thing that Plato is trying to have. Um, right. We're like if one is better than many provided that that is a good one if it's a bad one then many is better exactly. because maybe we'll get a one out of the many somehow which is weird something, something like that yeah yeah, yeah. that's that, that's yeah. the idea yeah. okay yeah okay now um, let, me fin let me finish this um it would seem that this variety uh, just as this variety is harmful from the form of constitution that is kingly and divine, so too for the one that is lowest and tyrannical is beneficial. Simplicity then is twofold, either better or worse than, than variety. Okay. Right, so it's not always good to be simple. It's only good to be simple if you're also good, which some is a problem because simple is good, so we have to figure out that. Okay. Um, one thing by taking on variety would be harmed and become worse, and so far it has been infected with what is worse. But the other thing would be benefited and become better as far as it has a benefit what is better. It seems to be complicated. Right. Like if you're purely bad, then variety can only make you better. If you're purely good, then variety can only make you worse. If you're in the middle, then I don't know. Yeah, so the um, remember this is something also again out, out of the elements, um, the propositions about um, late um, causes and holes, something like in the 60s. So, or like 59, 58. So um, the, the very top uh, things, the henans and matter are absolutely simple. But then the intermediate things, they have more causes and each cause contributes something. And so they get more complex. And the most complex thing is the thing in the, in, in the, exactly in the middle. Mm -hmm. And here he's doing, and there he just talked in, in terms of, sim, of, of simplicity and, and causes. Here he's doing the same thing, but with value. So at the thing at the bottom and at the top, um, uh, so of of the chain of value are are equally simple. Things in the middle are hmm. uh, are mixed. Yeah. So this hmm. also has to do with the uh, with the symposium, right? In the symposium, um, uh, Aristophanes' speech um, says that what everyone desires is to be whole. And so that they're always looking for their other half. But then Diotima comes along, then um, in her speech, uh, in Socrates' speech that she um, explains, um, she objects that actually, you know, there are situations where you don't want to be whole. For instance, if keeping your arm means that you're going to be dragged down to the sea, you prefer to have your arm cut off. And, and then um, Plato mentions after her speech that Aristophanes was going to say something to reply, but then Alcibiades comes in, right? Causes much ruckus. So we never hear Aristophanes reply, but there is the suggestion that, that, that there would be a reply. And so here again, you know, in some, uh, that fits this middle position, that the, the middle position is ambiguous. In some sense, you want to be whole, in some sense, you don't want to be whole, right? And hmm. I see. No, and in some sense, like we did over there, the human is like the most complicated thing in the universe. Exactly. Which means that and usually by becoming more human. simple, you become less human. Either more divine or more exactly. something else. Exactly. Exactly. You either become like a star or you become like a, like a beast. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and... Um, and right, it's like also in Plato's Republic, the 
the tyrant, you know, he has uh, his soul is unified only insofar as like eros, the most powerful passion, dominates all the other passions just by force. Um, whereas um, the philosopher, his soul is unified because it follows reason, and and all the passions are in their own ways. Hmm. Um, okay, 